we are going to begin. Looks like we don't have any more joining for the last 30 seconds. We appreciate you turning in. I am your host, Sarah Rosero. I work for Snohomish Conservation District and my job title there is Community Engagement Coordinator. Um, do a lot of outreach and just trying to reach you all at home during COVID right now to really get some of our programs out there and um, sharing information. Also tonight with us, we have Kari Kloss. She is a community engagement project manager with Snohomish Conservation District, and she's gonna be working on the back end and helping answer some questions um, during tonight's presentation. So living with beavers. Beavers are wonderful, they're all around us and we get to hear from Elisa tonight why they're so special, things we can do when they are on our property, and all sorts of informative information. Um, how you're acting with us tonight, all audio lines are muted, only we'll be sharing video and able to speak. You all can use chat amongst yourselves, um, but questions will be in the Q&A function down here. We can answer some questions as we go, and then later if any questions come up at the end, we'll be happy to answer them. So if you don't know about Snohomish Conservation District, we work with all sorts of folks within communities of Snohomish County and Camino Island. We're non-regulatory and just offer lots of services from farm planning to community conservation, habitat restoration, and we offer technical, technical assistance within your communities. And another important function is offering youth education services. Some of the upcoming events, we have a Streamside Landowners webinar happening on November 14th. Also a rain barrel sale in Lake Stevens, where we'll be getting um, 55 gallon rain barrels out to folks in the community. So please check out our website if that's something you're interested in. Tonight, we're really happy to have Elisa Kerr with us. She wears many hats with Stonehorse Conservation District. Um, she does restoration, as well as manages the Living with Beavers program you're gonna hear about tonight, and also manages our plant sale. So if you're a customer of the plant sale, you can thank Elisa for her amazing planning, um, this, past, this past one, and then this one coming up in 2021. Also with us tonight, we're really happy to have City of Bothell's Christy Cox. Um, her position is the Surface Water Program Coordinator with Education and Outreach. And Christy's gonna say a little bit about what she does with the, dis well, with the district and then um, programs the city offers in general. But we just wanna thank you for joining in tonight and I'm gonna kick it off to Christy. Thank you, Sarah. And hello everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. As Sarah said, my name is Christy Cox with the City of Bothell, and my job is to help teach residents how to prevent stormwater pollution from entering local streams and rivers, as well as how you can reduce your risk of flooding. And I know that beavers sometimes get a bad rap for being the cause of flooding, but they actually do more good than harm for the environment. I've had the pleasure of working with Snohomish Conservation District for a few years now, and they offer a variety of programs to our residents that you may or may not know about. I know Sarah mentioned a few of them. So I just want to mention the ones that we've been fortunate enough to work with the district on because I think that our conservation districts are a very valuable resource, but I also think they're very underrated. So I just want to give them some kudos for some of the programs they offer, including things like technical assistance for drainage and private stormwater system issues, natural yard care, private land restoration, on-site septic programs, water quality monitoring, riparian enhancement, youth stormwater education and schoolyard projects, and most recently they did a green infrastructure community project over at the, the North Shore Senior Center. They installed some rain gardens this past summer to help prevent stormwater runoff. So I encourage you to see what programs are available to you at their website, snohomishcd.org. So thank you for being here again, everyone, and thank you to Snohomish Conservation District and Elisa for sharing your knowledge with us about beavers. Now I'll turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christy. 
I'm just going to share my screen here and get us rolling. Perfect. Okay, so of course, living with beavers with me. Um, so I do run the Living with Beavers program at the Snohomish Conservation District, and I also um, am the executive director of a small nonprofit called Beavers Northwest. So tonight I'm wearing my Snohomish Conservation District hat, um, but I have a lot of beaver expertise under my belt and um, can answer a lot of questions. So um, feel free to type those questions into the Q&A box, and we'll have some pauses throughout for Sarah to help um, facilitate those. So keep those questions slowing. and I'm happy to answer any that come up. Um, typically my work involves me actually being out in streams and wetlands. I get to wear chest waders. It's my favorite part of my job being out and about and experiencing these beaver habitats and seeing the impacts that beavers have on the landscape. Um, but tonight here we are inside uh, with our COVID times Zoom webinar that we're also familiar with these days. Um, I do have a cat named Elon who is currently sleeping in a chair next to me, but is very likely to jump up on my desk at some point. So don't be alarmed if that happens. We'll just take a little Elon break. Um, I also wanted to offer a really brief thank you to our funder, Department of Ecology. Um, we work really closely with the Department of Ecology on lots of programs. Um, and tonight's talk is funded by one of our programs with the Department of Ecology. So they provide a lot of generous grant funding for our work, um, both on the ground restoration, planting trees, and outreach work like this to get that information out to all of you and help provide that assistance uh, to private landowners. So tonight is all about beavers. We're gonna talk a little bit about who beavers are. Um, we're gonna talk about what they're doing. So why are beavers out there? What, what is that going on? Um, and we're gonna talk about why you should care, which is really my favorite part about all of this is that, you know, there's lots of wildlife around our area and we're really lucky and um, beavers are a really special piece of wildlife and we're devoting a whole hour to learning about beavers. So why are we doing that? Um, and then how does Snohomish CD fit in? So we've got a lot of great programs like the Living with Beavers program and we'll share a little bit more about that as well. So we'll dive right in. Um, I'd like to start with a poll. Um, so Sarah's gonna send out a poll that will pop up on your screen uh, just to get us a little bit more information about why you're here tonight and what you wanna learn so I can really tailor my talk to you as we go along. So the first question is just, have you ever seen a beaver? Please select one of our multiple choice options. And then the second question is, why are you tuning in tonight? Get those answers in. Probably give it about 10 more seconds to get those questions in before I end the poll. We appreciate your participation. You can look at this cute beaver as you're answering those questions. Okay, perfect. So we have our results here. Um, have you ever seen a beaver? It looks like a lot of folks have. A couple people have not or are not sure, which is great. We can help answer that question of whether you should, can be sure or not if you're looking at a beaver. And generally, it looks like we're here to learn more about beavers, but also learning about how to manage beavers on our property. So a little good mix of both, uh, which will cover all of that. So that's perfect. That's great to know. Um, that means you're interested in my whole talk, which is amazing. Um, okay, so let's get started with learning about beavers. Um, here is our beautiful beaver, which you just saw. Um, beavers are really big. And this is the first thing I like to start with is to really imagine beavers as really big animals with a really big impact on the landscape. So I think a lot of people envision a beaver and often when you've seen them, all you see is their little head in the water. So you think, oh my gosh, they're just a cute water rat. Um, but really beavers are huge and can be anywhere from on the small end about 25 pounds up to about 70 pounds as full grown adults, um, which is wild. It's a big range, but also a really big animal. Um, so think about kind of a small to medium sized dog and get that image in your head. And now imagine this beaver that you're seeing this picture of being that big. 
this is kind of a chunky beaver, so I'm thinking it's probably in that 50 to 60 pound range, just from a guess. Um, so beavers are big, and beavers live everywhere, is the main message I have for you. So this is an imperfect map of beaver range. So the dark green is kind of areas where you may find beavers. So you'll notice that's most of North America, all the way up into Canada. And of course, this isn't perfect because beavers don't follow political boundaries. So there are some beavers down in Mexico, but we get them all throughout the US and down into the Mexico area. The main ingredients that you need to have beavers in an area are water and woody vegetation. So if you have those two things, there's a likelihood that beavers can survive in that habitat. So that's all of US and most of Canada up to about the tundra. You'll see that green line kind of dips off there up at the very top of Canada because as you get into those frozen Northlands, you lose that water, you lose that woody vegetation. And then same as you go further south, less water, less woody vegetation. So beavers are all throughout. Um, which is pretty miraculous that we have these beavers. Um, tonight we're really talking about North American beavers. There is a second species of beaver, the Eurasian beaver, and they live over in Europe and Asia. Um, they are very similar, very hard to distinguish if you just put the two side by side. Um, but you know, here we are in North America, so we'll talk about North American beaver. And then our North American beavers have been introduced into South America. So there are beavers in South America, Originally, they're native just to the Northern Hemisphere, though. There are in our area some doppelgangers. So you may be out taking a walk through a wetland or on your property along the stream and see some animals and think, oh my gosh, is that a beaver? And um, so we'll talk through some of these doppelgangers. The first is a nutria. Um, nutria are about eight to 20 pounds, so a lot smaller than our big beavers, but a big nutria could look very similar in size to a small beaver. Um, the main difference between the nutria and the beaver is their tail. You'll notice that the nutria has a rat-like tail and beavers have that nice flat paddle-like tail. Um, and then also on their face, you'll notice the nutria has white, very conspicuous whiskers, whereas the beaver has really short, small, dark whiskers. So if you get close enough to really see those whiskers, you'll see on the nutria those really bright white whiskers. Um, so those are kind of the main differences. Nutria are an invasive species. They're considered an invasive species. Um, they were introduced to North America for fur. They're originally from South America. And as I mentioned, beavers were introduced to South America also for fur. So kind of a silly switch we made there. Um, and nutria are considered invasive because they're pretty destructive. So, um, you know, we may think of beavers as destructive, but it's kind of a natural destruction that we're used to or our habitats, our ecosystems are used to. But nutria really are more diggers than beavers are. So they'll dig into the side of stream banks and cause some increased erosion issues. Um, so nutria can be a big problem. We do have nutria in our area in Snohomish County. Um, there's a lot too in the Lake Washington area. So they could be coming up into the Bothell area for sure. Um, so nutria are around and they are tough. Um, but those couple differences are really important. And then we also have muskrat, which are native to our area, um, unlike nutria. And muskrat are kind of that small water rat. So beavers are really big, muskrat are really small. Um, I have been fooled more than once as I'm walking in a wetland by a muskrat thinking it's maybe a baby beaver. Um, but they, their main difference is that rat-like tail. Again, similar to nutria, nutria and muskrats both have rat-like tails versus the beaver's really big flat tail. Um, unfortunately, none of these animals swim with their tail up in the air. So you can kind of watch one for a while and be wondering and then they'll dive down and you'll see that tail and that's really the tell for you. Um, around here we also have river otters. So as you're walking along these stream signs in these aquatic habitats, you'll see potentially river otters or signs of river otters. Um, river otters are not rodents, unlike the other three creatures that I have up here, um, but they are mammals and they are semi-aquatic, so they'll be in and out of the water. Um, you'll notice that the river otters are kind of long and skinny like a wiener dog compared to all of our other kind of chunkier creatures that the rodents that we have here. Um, and river otters tend to kind of have really quick, rapid swim movements. They'll kind of be moving around a lot, um, very different from the other rodents in the group. And last but not least, we also have mountain beaver. Um, mountain beaver are very strange and very different. They are a 
very distantly related cousin to beaver, um, not more closely related to beaver than they are to any of these other rodents. Um, and kind of a misnomer that they're called a beaver. Uh, they're a very small creature, looks kind of more like a shrew or a hamster, um, and just are super funky. I highly recommend doing a little more research on mountain beavers because they're very strange and really special, but not related to beavers very much. Okay, so we want to move forward with beavers. They're our friends. Um, so beavers are considered choosy generalist herbivores. So they're herbivores, which means they're only eating plants. Um, they're generalists, so they'll eat just about anything, but they're choosy because there are specific things that they like more than others. Um, so beavers will eat some herbaceous plants or um, aquatic plants. So you'll see this beaver here munching on a little pond lily. Um, and they'll eat kind of tubers and grasses. So in the summertime, they're eating all kinds of stuff, um, all that nice greenery that's up. But in the winter, really all that's available to them is tree bark. And they will eat this in the summer as well. So they really like to eat the bark and the cambium, which is the layer just underneath the bark. And so that's part of the reason why they are often chewing down trees or chewing on trees and branches. And if you're walking through an area that does have beavers, you might find some of these sticks that have been totally denuded of their bark and you'll see little teeth marks on them. And that just means a beaver had a nice tasty snack. Um, so beavers are choosy. As I mentioned, they have a, several species that they like to eat more than others. And one of the great things about the species that, of trees that beavers like to munch on is that some of them have this beautiful ability to re-sprout. So you'll notice this photo on the left um, is of a young cottonwood that was chewed down by beavers and then re-sprouted. So you'll see that stump in the middle there with all those teeth marks on it. And so both cottonwoods and willows and sometimes even vine maples will all have this tendency to re-sprout, which is really amazing. I think as we, we as people see a tree that has been felled by a beaver and we think, oh my gosh, the beavers are killing all the trees, it's horrible. Um, and certainly some of the trees they chew do die, but the beauty is that sometimes they're just kind of changing the growth structure of some of those trees or plants. So, you know, these cottonwoods and willows may not grow to be a really tall, straight tree, and instead are gonna be this kind of shrubby vegetation um, which has different benefits for the ecosystem than maybe that tall tree does. So that's a really neat feature of some of these trees that beavers are chewing. Um, if we were in person together, I would take this time to kind of pass around some sticks that have been chewed by beavers and pass around a skull and kind of show you all those cool features. Um, but I just wanted to call to attention kind of the features of chewed trees from beavers. So you'll notice all of these have the same kind of sharp point where bees, beavers have chewed them off. As you get bigger trees, you get kind of more this hourglass situation that happens as beavers chew all the way around the circumference of that tree. And beavers are really able to do this because of their strong teeth. So you'll notice in this photo of the skull and then this photo of the cute beaver smiling at us um, that those front teeth are really significant. They're really big. And the front edge of those teeth is bright, bright orange or yellow. And that's because those teeth are reinforced with iron, but only the front part. So you'll notice in this photo of the skull, the back is not reinforced with iron, which means as the beavers chew, the back wears away more quickly than the front. So their teeth are almost self-sharpening. As the beavers chew, the back is wearing away more quickly than the front. It continues to be sharp on the front and beaver teeth continue to grow throughout their life. So their teeth are growing, they're chewing on trees. It's a pretty amazing cycle. Um, I like to point out when I give this talk to children that you know, we can't really chew on trees that would destroy our teeth, but beavers have such a really great adaptation to be able to chew on these trees and continue to do so throughout their lives. So food is one of the main reasons beavers are chewing on these trees, but it's not the only reason. Of course, dams are another really big reason. Um, and this is something we're most familiar with when it comes to beavers and their impacts is chewing on trees and dam building. Um, so I have three different photos of dams up here because I wanted to highlight kind of the diversity in dam building techniques and uh, materials that beavers utilize depending on where they're at and what kind of beaver they are. Um, so, you know, the photo down on the bottom here is of a dam primarily constructed out of small sticks, uh, some larger trees, and mud, which is kind of our typical image of a beaver dam. It's just lots of sticks, lots of trees, kind of beautiful structure. Um, but that's not the only thing that beavers will utilize. They utilize a lot of mud. This dam here on the upper left is mostly mud and kind of um, litter, leaf litter and debris, and not a lot of big sticks or trees in there. And then this dam on the top right 
was built in a agricultural ditch in a reed canary grass field and the dam was built almost entirely of reed canary grass and reed canary grass root balls. So the beavers were building out of all these different varied materials um, and it's really dependent on what's available to the beavers and kind of the temperament of the beaver that you're dealing with as well. Um, certainly this photo on the upper left, there's lots of vegetation around. You can see they have plenty of access to sticks, but they just felt like building it out of mud. Um, so beavers really utilize whatever is available to them. I've seen a lot of sticks and stones in dams. Um, in more urban areas, I've seen them utilize trash. Um, so they're really utilizing whatever is available to them. Someone just recently sent me a video of a beaver that was being, a young beaver that was being rehabilitated in someone's home. And it was just taking everything out of the bathroom and piling it by the door. So there was like a toilet brush and like some soap and some cleaner and a towel and it was just piling them. So it's like just this instinct that they have to put whatever possible to block an area. Um, so beavers are really funny in that way that they're just building all of these funky dams. Um, and really the point of these dams is to build habitat. The beavers are very big and very awkward. Um, they, I've heard them described as the milk dud of the forest, right? Just a big juicy treat um, for any big predators. So they're very awkward when they're on land. They have those back webbed feet. So as they're walking, it's just like very strange. They can't move very fast. But when they're in the water, they can swim and they are really smooth and sleek and quick. And so um, by building a dam, they're just flooding an area to create more wetted area for them, more area for them to be able to swim, more area for them to feel safe, more of a perimeter for them to be able to get to different trees growing, different food sources. So these dams are really constructed so that beavers can feel more comfortable. They're building themselves a bigger, wider space to be in. Um, and a common misconception is that beavers live in these dams, but really they're building these dams to create a pond where they can live in. So um, they like to live in their ponds and they'll build separate structures besides the dam to be their home. So here's a photo of a big beaver pond with a lodge there in the background um, that beavers are living in. So these lodges are primarily constructed, once again, of sticks and mud and whatever is available to beavers. Um, and the lodges are really unique and special because they do have an underwater entrance to get in. So it's harder for predators to access, right? They're assuming that these are predators that are coming from land. And so underwater access and then inside is a beautiful dry chamber for the beavers to hang out in, to nap, to eat, to raise young, etc. Um, and because beavers are big, these lodges are also huge. So you'll notice this top right photo has three grown adults standing on top of a huge beaver lodge, which is really amazing. Um, and lodges are often depicted in the center of a pond, which does happen quite frequently, as these top two photos show. But often they, they can be on the side of a pond or on the shore as well. Beavers will build bank lodges where they'll dig into the side of a pond or a stream bed and kind of dig themselves out a burrow and then live inside of that and start building maybe sticks on top of that. So um, if you see all of these signs of beavers, you see some of those chewed sticks, et cetera, um, you see some dams, but you just don't see a lodge or anywhere where beavers are living, don't be alarmed. They're probably dug into the bank somewhere. Um, so pretty neat. Oh, there's my picture of an underwater entrance. Perfect. So here's the underwater entrance, a nice little drawing with inside a dry chamber for eating and snacking and resting and raising young. Um, and this is a really neat photo of inside of a lodge. There was a great uh, live stream in 2019 at the Mendenhall Glacier area um, where they had somehow gotten a camera inside of a beaver lodge and you could tune in at any time of the day. And beavers are often nocturnal. So when I was tuning in in the day, they were always like in this cute little cuddle puddle sleeping inside their lodge, which was really special. Um, so pre pretty neat. Uh, beavers do live in family groups. So you'll notice in this photo, there's two beaver beavers inside that lodge. Um, typically, beavers will find a mate. So there will be a mama and a papa beaver. And then they'll have about one to three kits every year. Um, and those kits will stay with them until they're two years old. So here's a couple photos of some kits. Point Defiance Zoo had a kit born, I believe, last year. Google it. Very cute videos of this little baby beaver. Love it. Um, and so those kits will stay with them until they're two years old and they'll learn from mom and dad they'll learn from their older siblings those one-year-olds those two-year-olds that are still hanging around um, and they all work together to build dams repair lodges do all of that gather food 
Um, so you could, if you see an area with beavers, once again, you might have just one lone bachelor or bachelorette beaver, or you could have up to seven to 10 beavers all living together in this colony. Um, so really neat familial structure. And then those two-year-olds will move out, they'll find their own place, um, you know, kind of like people, sometimes they'll be rebellious and go really, really far. I've heard of beavers traveling like hundreds of miles and sometimes they'll stay really close to home and stay right near mom and dad and maybe just move a hundred feet down the street. So beavers on the move is a really big thing when they're two years old, which is why you kind of see beavers colonizing new areas uh, regularly because the more and more beavers we have, the more and more beavers there are dispersing to new spaces. Okay, so I'm going to take a pause. That's the end of our chat about just what are beavers doing. Um, and next we're going to move on to beaver benefits, but I want to take a quick break and see if there are any questions. Um, so feel free to type those in if you have any lingering questions about beaver biology or, or traits um, before we move on to benefits. Thanks, Lisa. I, <laughs> I love Cuddle Puddle. I think um, we still have t-shirts that say beavers are the milk dead of the forest. I agree. It's great. Marketable for sure. <laughs> Oops. Um, we don't have any questions right now. Ooh, sorry, we do have a question. Um, do beavers mate for life? Is that something you're aware of? Yeah, great question. Um, so yes, uh, with the caveat that um, you know, mating for life is debatable in the animal world, right? Yes, beavers will mate for life, but if one beaver passes away or has an untimely death, then they might find a new mate, etc. cetera. Um, but yes, you know, if two beavers are established in a colony, they're hanging out together, they're staying there together. Um, I haven't heard of many beaver divorces or breakups, but hard to tell, you know, they don't have like reality TV for beavers, unfortunately. I, and that's kind of sad because I would watch that, but. Yeah, those cuddle puddles would be really fun. <laughs> um, we have another question about who are the major predators of beavers? Yeah, um, so beavers in kind of our urban environment, of course, their major predator is just people. Um, and historically, they're one of the big predators is people as well, especially as we get into the late 1800s, early 1900s, as if we have white settlers and trappers moving in and trapping out beavers. Um, but in terms of natural predators, it's really big animals for adult beavers, right? If you're a 50 pound beaver, there's not a lot that can take you down. Pretty much bears, cougars, wolves, um, so here in our kind of urban suburban area, those animals aren't necessarily getting to beavers. Um, big plug for following Voyagers National Park uh, Wolf Project on Facebook or social media. They do a lot of work with wolves and there's this particular pack there that has learned how to catch beavers and they like 80% of their diet in the summer is just beavers. It's wild. Highly recommend checking it out. Um, so those big predators, of course, small beavers, you know, young kits, they're, they're really little and they're really precious and cute and still a tasty milk dud. Um, so those can be eaten by a lot of other predators, um, you know, a lot smaller stuff. Maybe coyotes could occasionally maybe get an adult beaver, but definitely get a baby beaver, birds of prey, maybe even river otters would be eating those kits. So um, they're a lot more susceptible, certainly. Yeah, and just one follow-up question from that. Is there, has there been any sightings of like bears going out to a beaver lodge to try to really infiltrate if they're desperate for food or resources? That's a great question. I have not seen any of that, but I would not be surprised um, if that were to happen. I think it would be difficult. Uh, you know, a beaver is not just going to sit there while something's like digging into its lodge. They're going to escape through one of those underwater entrances. So I have not seen that, um, but you know, once again, wouldn't be surprised if I ever saw a video of it happening. I don't think that it would be very successful, which is maybe why it doesn't happen often. Thank you. And um, yeah, we'll continue to move forward. And then any other questions we'll ask next time. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so let's move on to some beavery benefits. So a big part of why beavers are beneficial is this dam building. 
Um, so if you think about a beaver habitat, they're building all these different structures and they're really ecosystem engineers. They're kind of selfish about it. They're building dams for themselves, but then it has all of these other far reaching benefits. Um, so if you think about a traditional stream just kind of flowing through a narrow pathway and then you start having beavers move in and building dams all along that length, you're gonna get this complexity, this whole difference in the ecosystem as they flood out new areas, maybe create new side channels, et cetera. Um, so ecosystem engineers is really the best description for beavers and what leads to some of these benefits. Um, so a big one is just building aquatic habitat. Like I said, it's pretty selfish. They're doing it for themselves to create more ponded area where they can swim around and be less catchable milk duds. Um, but it has these extra benefits for other wildlife. So sometimes these ponded areas will flood out big trees and create standing snags, which is really great for cavity nesting birds and woodpeckers. And it's also a really great perch for raptors and other big birds. Um, it's also creating more ponded area for waterfowl and birds like herons that love to fish, right? We're creating these shallow pool areas uh, for fish to hang out in. Um, and then of course amphibians benefit a lot from those wetted areas, areas for amphibians to lay eggs and to hide and eat food, lots of bugs attracted to these ponded areas. Um, River otters, which I've already mentioned a couple times, really benefit from these ecosystems as well. More food availability, more places to hide. Um, lots of bugs and of course fish. Uh, beaver ponds are really, really important uh, rearing habitat for juvenile salmon and other fish, um, particularly salmon like coho that spend up to a year as juvenile fish in fresh water. So they really need these areas to hide. If we just have a straight and narrow stream that's constantly flowing, those fish get really tired, there's not a lot of food for them, nowhere for them to hide from predators. But if we have this really complex and messy beaver pond, that's a great spot for juvenile fish to hide. There's lots of logs for them to go under, lots of deep spots where there's nice cool water refuge, lots of those bugs in the pond for them to eat. Um, so really, really great dynamic places for wildlife, um, building a lot of that habitat. Um, a question that I get a lot is what about fish passage? You know, we, we have been taught really well to think about salmon in our waterways um, and think about how are our fish gonna move upstream as they're spawning and back downstream as juveniles heading back out to the ocean. Um, so the main thing that I like to convey as we talk about fish passage and beavers is that beavers build habitat for fish. And historically, uh, before white settlers came to the area and trappers trapped out a lot of beaver, and we you know, degraded a lot of this fish habitat, uh, there were way more salmon on the landscape and way more beavers on the landscape. And they have essentially evolved together and been in the same place. So um, a phrase that I've heard is that beavers taught salmon to jump. We, as we know that salmon can jump over these big obstacles. They're amazing strong fish that are trained to get upstream. Um, and beaver dams are just one of those many natural obstacles that they've met. Uh, so in a natural system, what we see is we get these big rain events in the fall, which is right when the fish start to run upstream. And then when we get those big rain events, water is flowing over and around beaver dams. They're not perfect, so water is flowing through the beaver dams and fish are able to jump over or swim around through a side channel to get over these beaver dams. And then in the same turn, those juveniles as they head downstream are small. They're able to wiggle through those little spaces in the dam. Unlike human-built dams, which are these giant massive walls of concrete, uh, beaver dams are, as we mentioned, built out of sticks and mud, and they have all these interstitial spaces that fish can wiggle through. And once again, water is flowing over and around them as well. So um, in terms of fish passage, beaver dams are not typically a barrier. That being said, when we as people have modified a stream system and made it a straight narrow channel that has concrete sidewalls that are 10 feet tall, and then a beaver builds a dam in that, right? There's no natural process happening there. Um, and so in that case, a beaver dam may be a barrier to fish, but is it the beaver's fault or the people's fault? Hard to say. Um, so another benefit of beavers as ecosystem engineers is that they're improving water quantity, really increasing our quantity of water on the landscape. Um, so this is a great graphic here that, um, was published by King County. They have a great beaver working group that's putting out a lot of really great publications. Um, that's a good resource. Uh, so beavers 
are building these dams, which are holding on to water, which is really storing water, um, and can also help to attenuate floods by holding on to that water when we get these big rain events and then slowly releasing it downstream. As I mentioned, beaver dams aren't perfect. So they're kind of always leaking. So what happens is we get a lot of water storage in the winter and then continuous flow throughout the summer coming out of these beaver dams. Um, and then they're also pushing a lot of water into the ground as this graphic shows, increasing our groundwater storage, uh, really pushing water in there, recharging our groundwater. Um, and so that's just improving that water quantity is really, really important. And then they're also improving water quality. Um, so these ponds that beavers create really are wetlands and in a lot of places creating these big wetlands. Uh, and wetlands have an amazing ability to clean up water. Um, these beaver dams catch a lot of sediment, all that fine sediment moving downstream uh, so that the water is clearer, which is very important for our salmon species. And then wetlands have a lot of really great ability to clean up different pollutants so they can uh, decrease nutrient levels. The, all the bugs and the plants in wetlands will kind of eat up a lot of that uh, nutrients so that downstream water is uh, better water quality. Um, so that's a really special facet of this beaver ecosystem engineering is that they're actually improving water quality as well as quantity. So all these things together, building aquatic habitat, improving water quantity and water quality, uh, really leads to this term of ecosystem resilience. We're creating resilient ecosystems by having just beavers on the landscape, a really passive thing. If we just let beavers do their thing, then we get this resilience in our ecosystem. We attenuate floods, we improve water quantity, we improve habitat for all these different species, as we mentioned, and we improve water quality, which is really special. A neat facet of this is a potential climate change mitigation that beavers can help with. Um, so if we imagine, this is a very, very simplified graph, but if we imagine our stream flows on the y-axis here uh, throughout the seasons, in the winter we see stream flows come up as we get a lot of rain, and then in the summer those stream flows come down as our snow melts uh, through the spring, and then summer, you know, not a lot of input, not a lot of rain, not a lot of snow left, and then coming back up in the winter, etc. This is kind of our historic trend. What we're seeing with climate change and kind of the effects that are projected and trending is that in our area, we're gonna start seeing a lot more precipitation, but it's all gonna be falling in the winter. So we're gonna see a lot more precipitation overall, but a lot less in the summer. So that means we're getting higher peak flows in the winter. Our streams will be flowing quicker, faster, fuller in the winter, and then drier in the summer. Um, so kind of dramaticizing those two ends of the spectrum. What we can do with beavers is have them start building their dams, just do their thing, and that starts to reverse these trends. So the beavers are storing that water, so instead of those peak flows just all rushing downstream really quickly, the dams will help to hold on to that water and kind of release it slowly allowing for those summer flows to stay at a level that's more natural and more normal. Um, so this is a really interesting benefit of beavers and a potential uh, help for some of those effects we're seeing from climate change. And this is really that resilience that we're talking about, right? We're building resilience in our ecosystem. It can withstand these changes uh, really well. Okay, so we're gonna take another pause on that nice hefty note and see if there's any more questions for us. Yeah, one of the questions we got was, um, someone had seen a beaver dam that was about a quarter of a mile long. What's the variety, diversity, and the length of beaver dams? Can they get pretty long? Yes, definitely. So some of those dams that I showed you in those photos are pretty small. You know, we might have a small stream that's only a couple feet wide and the dam will just be a couple feet wide. But what happens is as beavers build a dam on a stream, water starts to try and flow around the edges. So then beavers will kind of keep building that dam out and out. So you might see a, the start of a beaver dam is gonna be really small, it's just gonna span the stream. But then as they back up all that water and start building that pond, their dam will start expanding and expanding. Um, so it's pretty dependent on the topography of the area, right? If you have a very steep, narrow valley, then the dam won't be quite so long. But if it's a really 
flat area, that dam is going to extend really far. Um, I have heard about the record beaver dam that someone identified from aerial imagery. They were looking at this like really remote area in Canada and they found from satellites, they saw a dam that was about a mile long. And so wild, like there's some wild photos of that, that just like someone was just cruising on Google Earth and was like, whoa, that's a beaver dam and like checked it out and like measured it and it's a mile long. And so obviously that's something that's been there for a really long time, right? A beaver didn't just build that yesterday. Um, that's probably been continuously occupied by beavers for a hundred years. And they've just kind of slowly built that dam out and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but that's kind of the power, right? That's like remote Canada. There's literally no one anywhere nearby. Uh, someone tried to trek out there and it took them like three days just to get out there. Um, so if we just like let beavers do their thing and have all of the space they could possibly have, they could have dams that are a mile long. <laughs> um, but certainly that's uh, an exception, right? Most beaver dams are not quite that big. Um, kind of average, I would say, would be like 15 to 20 feet with expansion depending on topography, um, et cetera. Thanks, Lisa. Um, are you aware of some maybe the benefits of beaver beaver ponds to ducks and other waterfowl? Yeah, um, primarily it's just that access right to water, this nice area habitat for them. Um, there was a really great paper that I've seen that mentioned that um, duck brood sizes, so the number of young that they have increase in beaver ponds versus other areas. And that's probably due to food availability, uh, places to hide from predators, etc. And um, so beaver ponds are just really beneficial to waterfowl in general, that water access, food availability, all of that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we don't really have any more questions, but just a great comment about the headwaters of Isaac Lake, Bowron Lake Park, Canada, Terrace Dams, quite long, interlaced like a broad series of crisscross locks. And I just, I love how people see that once and it sticks with them. Mm -hmm. It's something memorable. And I mean, they're just impressive structures. It is really neat. And I like to, I like to see those beaver complexes really. It's, you know, it's not just one dam in a small area. Beavers, if they have a lot of area and a lot of ability, they'll build dam after dam after dam that kind of creates this whole necklace of ponds and wetlands. So that's really special. One last question and then we'll move on. Um, and that is, why do beavers slap their tail to the water? Yeah, great question. So that's really beavers like warning and defense mechanism all wrapped in one. Um, beavers aren't very aggressive. You know, they don't have, they have those big teeth, but really they're for chewing trees, not for chewing other animals. Um, so their defense is, I'm gonna slap my tail on the water and sound really big and scary and hopefully scare somebody away. And um, so if you are to walk up to a beaver pond, if they sense you, they might slap their tail on the water, hoping to scare you away. Um, but it also is a warning to their family, right? They're living in these family groups. So they say, hey, there's something weird over here. Don't come over here. Um, I'm trying to scare it away. You should go back to the lodge or whatever. So that's kind of a response that we see often and is one of those telltale signs that you're seeing a beaver and not a doppelganger. Uh, like we talked about. So pretty neat. Okay, so we're going to move into management now. So for those of you looking for answers about what to do on your property, hopefully this will help. Um, so all of these amazing benefits, all these ecosystem engineering feats that beavers have can lead to problems. Um, so what we often see in our urban and suburban and rural even lifestyles is that uh, we like as humans to live and work and play near uh, waterways and that's exactly where beavers like to live and work and play as well. And um, so that can lead to a lot of issues including flooding. So some of the conflicts that we typically see are tree, tree, tree chew, that's a tongue twister, uh, culvert blockage and just really general flooding. So luckily there are solutions to all of these and we'll kind of walk through each of them really quickly um, and then talk about what SCD can do to help you. Um, so one of the solutions to any of these beaver conflicts is beaver trapping and beaver relocation. Uh, trapping, lethally trapping beavers is legal in Washington. 
uh, if you have a trapper's license or if you hire a, a legal trapper, a licensed trapper. Um, and it's unique because in Washington in 2001, body gripping traps were outlawed and those are the kind that just kill the beavers in place. So everybody has to use live traps. Um, so this is an option um, that is available to folks. Uh, relocation is another option that's only recently legal in Western Washington. Um, so we are seeing more relocators come up on the scene. So these are photos from relocations that the Tule Lip tribes did. They have a great program that's been going for several years. So these relocations are taking these problem beavers from our urban and suburban and rural, rural areas and moving them up into the mountains for restoration. Um, so relocation is a really great strategy for restoring uh, areas that maybe don't have beavers but could benefit from them because of all these great benefits we've talked about. Um, so trapping is an option um, and is something that is often necessary in our urban or suburban areas, right? We're living along these waterways that are really confined by our human land use. Um, and unfortunately, oftentimes these beaver conflicts are really due to maybe us being a little too close, uh, our businesses, our homes, whatever, being too close to waterways. Um, but oftentimes there's not really a clear solution except for to remove the beavers. Um, so it's important to be aware that this is something that goes on uh, in our area. And if you ever see these traps out and about, certainly, you know, feel free to ask questions and, and et cetera, but those are things that need to be left alone. Um, and beaver trapping and relocation is, as I said, sometimes necessary, but is also temporary, can be temporary, right? So if we do have an area that is really, really good beaver habitat, maybe a restoration site where we've just planted 10,000 willows and kind of got this beautiful stream system going through, um, beavers are going to find that over and over again, right? We've got those two-year-old beavers dispersing, uh, leaving mom and dad every now and then. Um, and they're looking for new areas. So we do have a lot of beavers in our region and they're always dispersing. And so if there is a spot that is, you know, attractive to beavers to build, it's likely that there will be beavers there again, even if you remove them. So thinking about some of these other in-place management solutions that we offer um, is really important and, and really considering, you know, is trapping the best option here or can we do something else? So for instance, tree chew is in the conflict that we see really often. Um, and the solution here is just wrapping trees. It seems really simple and really easy, um, and it can be uh, if done correctly. Um, and really, we're just trying to exclude beavers from being able to access these trees and get to them. So kind of two different photos. The one on the left here is of a recent restoration planting that was done. So these are new, young baby trees that we just want to protect, let them get big enough so that they can maybe survive some of that tree chew. Um, or kind of on the right here, we've got some bigger, more established uh, trees that really need to be protected because they are a valuable resource. It's taken a long time for them to grow and maybe we don't have a lot of giant trees in this area. So we want to protect our few that we have. Um, so with tree wrapping, it's important that it's tall, right? We've talked about that our beavers are big. They're, you know, upwards of 70 pounds and they're also about three feet tall if they're really standing up. So I recommend using fencing that is at least three feet tall, four feet if you can find it, um, and using kind of robust fencing. Um, I've seen folks use uh, just a layer of chicken wire and wrap it like right next to a tree, and then the beavers will chew through the chicken wire because it's kind of flimsy and those teeth are really strong. So I recommend using like pretty thick gauge garden fencing. You can buy it in rolls. Like I said, four feet tall is best. Three feet is probably okay as well. Um, and then wrapping it away from the tree. So you'll notice in both these photos, we've kind of removed that fencing from the tree. It's not right up against it. If it's right up against it, the beavers can maybe chew through it and your tree is gonna be restricted in its growth. So removing it from the tree a little bit, wrapping it around outside of the tree there. So that's a really quick and easy solution, right? If your only problem is beaver, beavers chewing on your trees, we got it, we know what to do about it. Um, another conflict that we see often is culvert blockage. Um, you know, we around here have a lot of culverts in our area, uh, under roadways, etc. And they're really just this attractive thing to beavers. It's like a hole in a perfectly good dam that is the roadbed. And they can really hear and feel that water moving and it just drives them wild. So um, they'll block those up. You can kind of see the culvert just sticking out of this photo here on the bottom. Um, and luckily what we're seeing is this trend towards no more of those small culverts that can't really handle our streams. 
we're moving towards big culverts or really big bridges. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily stop beavers. This is probably about a 12 foot diameter culvert. Um, really, really big, which like, you're like, oh wow, the beavers can't be attracted to build in there. And yet they're building this little tiny dam across, right? So um, culvert blockage is a really common problem with beavers. Um, and we have a really easy solution. Uh, the solution here is exclusion fencing. Um, and this fencing typically has this trapezoidal shape like this. So you'll see the culvert here. And these folks are standing by and then we have a trapezoid coming off uh, of that. And this fence really just removes beavers from that culvert, keeps them away from it a little bit. Uh, so they're not, they can't hear or feel the water flowing as much. And if they can, they're right here next to the culvert. So what will happen with these culvert exclusion fences is beavers might build right up next to the culvert, but then not along the front face here. So we've still got a flow path for water to move through and that's great. Um, this is essentially a fence in a stream. So it does require some maintenance, you know, sometimes sticks or leaves will just get caught up on the fence. So it does require pulling those off on occasion. Um, but in general, these are really good solutions to prevent beavers from getting in. And then the last problem that we see quite regularly is just really general flooding. Um, you know, beavers are building these dams and they want to flood out an area and it's good when it does and creates kind of these big wetlands, but oftentimes that's impacting us, maybe impacting our homes or our roads or our agricultural fields. Um, so the solution for general flooding that we uh, tout is pond levelers. They're a pretty simple device, really just a pipe that goes through the dam. So here on the bottom, we have this, um, like schematic drawing of one. So we've got the dam and both these pictures, water is flowing from the left to the right. Um, so the pipe goes through the dam and we set the pipe at a height that makes sense for us. So maybe your road next to your home or your driveway is getting flooded. Um, and if we just bring that water level down by six inches to a foot, then we're fine with the pond that beavers create. These pond levelers are really a compromise between people and beavers. We want to keep some habitat and some of those benefits of a beaver pond and a beaver wetland, but minimize and mitigate those flooding risks that we're seeing from the beavers just continuing to build maybe that upwards of a mile long dam. Um, so we're really just setting that level that we want the pond to be at and allowing the water to flow. Beavers will build kind of around the pond leveler, but water will keep moving through the pipe. So they're really, really neat, nifty little devices and fun to install. Um, so here's our three types of conflict that we're seeing, tree chew, culvert blockage, general flooding, and we have solutions for all of them, which is amazing. And this is one of those spots where the Snohomish Conservation District comes in. So our Living with Beavers program is not only presenting to you all of these options, but also provides opportunities for us to um, help you plan these uh, solutions, uh, help you install them, uh, help walk through that whole process of, you know, do you need permits? Should you get permits? What do you need to do? Um, so often what we're doing is we're providing site visits. That's kind of the first step is, well, I, I'm the beaver person. So you'll call me and I'll say, hey, you know, here's what we can offer you. Um, tell me about your beaver problem, what's going on. And then we'll schedule a time for me to come visit your property and take a look at those beaver issues and help talk through, you know, what, what's going on here, what needs to happen, et cetera. Um, we provide assistance with permitting and all of these solutions are in water. So they do require a permit from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's free and we can help walk through how it goes, um, which is really great. Um, I've applied for several myself, so I know how they go. And then we also can assist with materials and installation. If you're within an area that, um, fits within one of our grants that provides some of this beaver work or um, has a high priority for maintaining beavers on the landscape. So we can assist with those materials and installation as well. Um, this is our WCC, our Washington Conservation Corps crew helped me install a pond leveler in Lake Stevens. So um, maybe we'll even get a chance to get them out in their chest waders too. Um, and there's so much more. So as Sarah mentioned, the conservation district does a lot. Um, I'm the beaver person, but we have 25 other staff that do a lot of varied work, um, including farm planning and stormwater management and uh, other habitat features. So we do all of that. We also have the plant sale, which Sarah so wonderfully plugged for us um, that I help run. So if you just need a few plants, make sure to check out our plant sale. It's coming up in February. Um, so a lot of services that we offer at the Conservation District. So always call us, email us, reach out to us, um, and we're happy to help. Um, 
So I just wanted to point out, since we're talking about City of Bothell and everything going on, um, living with beavers in the North Creek watershed, I just quickly pulled up a map of North Creek outlined in purple here, um, the North Creek watershed in the Bothell area. And um, all of these orange dots represent beavers that I know about in the area. So these are just ones that I pulled out of my head from either calls I've gotten from landowners or just um, looking at iNaturalist or other situations um, knowing about where beavers are. So the main message I wanted to get across here is that there are beavers in the Bothell area, there are beavers in Western Washington, and there's lots of them. So lots of opportunities for beavers to be moving throughout um, our region. Uh, you know, if you live near a streamside or on a lake, um, always be on the lookout for beavers and, and think about all these different solutions that we have. And feel free to give me a call here at the Conservation District and we can talk through it. Because uh, I know it can be really scary to have those beavers move in and be making all their ecosystem engineering changes. Uh, but there's solutions. So, and it can be a really neat wildlife spotting opportunity. Um, so I wanted to point just a couple more resources out uh, as we finish up here. Um, we do have a fact sheet uh, at the Conservation District that I'm happy to share with anybody that wants a little bit more info, some more in-depth information about beavers. Um, there's a great Department of Fish and Wildlife publication that's many more pages than our Conservation District one called Living with Wildlife, and they have a whole beaver uh, series. So it has a lot of really great facts, et cetera. And then if you really, really want to dive in and want to nerd out about beavers and their impacts, there's this great pub publication by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service called the Beaver Restoration Guidebook. And it has a lot, a lot of information about how the benefits of beavers and how to manage them. So that's if you just listen to this and you're like, I need so much more. Um, there's also a great book that came out uh, two years ago called Eager. Uh, and that's a really great book if you're just like loving beavers now. So I wanted to open it up one last time for questions. Um, my contact info is on here. I will say that I'm working from home right now and this is my office number. So if you really wanna get a hold of me, email is definitely the best way. And I do work part-time at the Conservation District. So um, email is definitely the way to get a hold of me and don't be alarmed if I don't get back to you for a day or two because I'm only tuning in a couple days a week. Thank you so much, Lisa. I've, you know, I've heard this talk a few times and each time I just learn something more, something new, always freshening it up and I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so we have some questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> I'm just going to start in order received. So um, how do you think current beaver populations in Snohomish County compare to historic populations? That's a great question. Um, so I don't have numbers for Snohomish County, you know, historically, et cetera. Um, but what I do know is that across North America, there are estimates that um, pre-white settlement and trappers, there were upwards of 400 million beavers across North America. And then that went down to about 9 million uh, in the early 1900s. So huge reduction in beaver populations. Um, and what we've seen is anecdotally kind of an increase incrementally over the years of beavers. Um, they're pretty resilient creatures, so they continue to uh, build up their populations. Um, but really reduced numbers, right? So there probably used to be beavers on every mile of stream throughout our whole region. Um, and now you saw that map with the orange dots, which is by no means complete, but certainly a lot less than there historically were. So I do think that, you know, historically we had a ton of beavers in the area. We currently have quite a few beavers in the area, <laughs> but population estimates are pretty hard um, because they do live in colony groups. So we could kind of, you know, estimate colonies, but then it's like, okay, well, how many beavers are in each colony? Um, and they're constantly dispersing. Those two-year-olds are moving. So it's really hard to get those good population estimates. I appreciate that. Yeah, we had a similar question about is there a hard number of populations in King Stormish County and that's just a hard number to really determine because of those, you know, colony. Yeah, I haven't seen any really good surveys uh, locally or nationally uh, or continentally about, you know, how many beavers there are currently, um, but certainly there's quite a few uh, out there. Um, so getting back to some of the 
exclusion fencing and everything else with the fencing there's a question about if fish able are able to get through that fencing yeah great question so the fencing that we utilize is um we use cattle panels so they have really big mesh they've got about a six inch by eight inch mesh um which is big enough for our adult fish to get through um there is a man who worked at snohomish county who pioneered a lot of this beaver management stuff in Western Washington. And he took one of those panels to a fish hatchery and like stuck it in the raceway to like confirm, yes, fish can get through. Um, so those fences, we, we utilize material that is passable for fish. That being said, if they're not maintained and if, you know, a lot of leaves and sticks start racking up on it, then it becomes a lot less passable for fish, right? We're taking those small panels that work for fish to get through and then decreasing the size by having all that debris on there. So they do require that maintenance to be passable to fish. Um, and the permitting that I mentioned is through the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So they're looking at these projects from the lens of, okay, can fish get through these devices that we're installing for beavers? So a lot of them have been vetted, but it's important that you don't just go throw fencing in the stream. Like I said, we wanna use the right materials. So call me if you wanna install one and we'll talk about how it goes. Well, moving into that question of what's the average cost of a pond leveler? Um, does it vary from the culvert exclusion fencing? Yeah, um, so the materials for a pond leveler typically come up to about $600. We recommend using pretty robust and big diameter pipe. So that's the bulk of the cost. The pipe itself costs about 500 bucks for the length of pipe and then some fencing um, on that pipe. Um, so pond levelers, materials alone cost about 600 bucks if you use the materials that I like to use. Um, culvert fences usually tend to be a little bit less because we're not buying that really expensive pipe. Um, the culvert fences tend to be, you know, around two to $300, depending on the size of the fence that we're building and the size of the culvert. Um, and then there's labor to install, right? So if you hire a contractor to do, to install one of these, they're probably going to cost anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars, kind of depending. Um, so that's where some of this assistance from the conservation district really comes into play. Um, that you know, if you're in an area where it's beneficial for us to do one of these devices, we can help provide financial assistance to install them. So really bring that cost down. I appreciate that. Um, is there? Do you know of similar opportunities like those keen conservation? have a Living with Beavers program or financial assistance, or can you recommend other organizations um, that can just provide services? Yeah, so King Conservation District does not have a beaver program that I am aware of. Um, I believe Snohomish Conservation District is the only conservation district with a robust beaver program. Um, that being said, you can hire contractors to do this work, uh, you know, I have another hat working at Beavers Northwest and we're a nonprofit that also does some of this work too. Um, so certainly if you're not within the Snohomish Conservation District region, uh, you can call me at Beavers Northwest and we can talk about it. Um, but there's not a lot of organizations doing it in Western Washington. I think there are certainly other potential restoration contractors that might be able to help through the process as well though. And you know, the other conservation districts are, would be able to provide some technical assistance, certainly. So if you live in King Conservation District's region, give them a call, they know about beavers, um, and they might have other recommendations. Perfect, and yeah, we had a lot of similar questions, so I kind of just grouped some of those together. Um, but someone would like to know what types of plants beavers do like. They live along a lake and want to provide some resources for the beavers, which is great. That is great, yeah. So. Um, Beavers are choosy, which I mentioned, um, and some of those species that they really like are cottonwoods and willows are really big. Um, and those are really nice and easy because you can buy them from nurseries and the willows you can buy from our plant sale as live stakes. So we just sell them as like a branch cut off of a tree and you just stick them in the ground. So really easy to install and they're such a tasty treat for beavers. So they really do love, I would say willows are a big one um, and cottonwoods are another one that they really, really like. And those are great to plant along lake shores and along streams as well. Thank you so much. Um, others are just saying excellent information, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. 
um, it's just really helpful and really just appreciate you being so informative. But last yeah. call for any questions too. Um, if there's anything else you would also like to mention, Elisa, or maybe now is a good time if you would can indulge me with a beaver skull preview or yeah of course thanks Sarah, for the <laughs> reminder i do i was showing sarah before we started here that i do have uh some beaver artifacts behind my head um so one of them is this beaver skull which is really really neat um and my favorite part about this beaver skull is that one of the front teeth is loose so i can pull it all the way out and you can see how long that beaver tooth is which is really cool and you get a good view of that nice uh iron enforced tooth on the front there and it just continues to grow right yeah they continue to grow throughout their life that's amazing it's pretty wild it. <laughs> yes beaver nerds beaver nerds of course yeah and i've got my you know my beaver sticks too so this is like a prize beaver stick from the collection with some nice teeth marks. It's got all that bark chewed off, like I mentioned. So they were getting the bark and the cambium, the layer underneath. So, you know, little beaver treats. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, yeah, anyone else, just if you have any information, please contact Snohomish Conservation District. Um, if you have beavers on your property and would like some assistance, please contact Elisa or the district and we'll get you connected to her. Um, and we just appreciate you joining in tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. That was fun. All right. I think this is where we say good night. Good night. Have a great night. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to Christy for joining us. And thanks for Kari for working the back end. I appreciate your help. Thank you so much, Lisa.